Professor Levenberg, Program Director, thank you for that very kind introduction. The Dean of the Faculty of Law, Professor Herat Lip, the representatives of the Weber Wenzel attorneys, Justice Laurie Akabe, members, other members of the judiciary, members of the, a member of the Commission for Gender Equality, senior members of the academic community here at the University of Stellenbosch, members of the legal profession, other members of society, students, ladies and gentlemen. I am deeply honored to present the, this year's annual Human Rights Law Lecture at the University of Stellenbosch. I'm particularly humbled by the interest that the academic community, particularly this university, has shown in my office, the public protector. I must confess, though, that the main attraction for me coming here and accepting this opportunity was to renew my acquaintance with Professor Sandy Liebenberg, who for many years has been one of this country's leading lights on the pursuit of human rights, particularly socioeconomic rights. I must also confess that she once tried to poach me from Kells. Um, I sincerely apologize that we're starting late because there were problems with my speech, but I'm gonna lay a bit of the problems at the door of Professor Lebenberg. <laughs> when we discussed this morning the, um, the context of the lecture, she told me about the big shoes that I had to fill. She didn't call them big shoes, but that's how I interpreted them. She told me about all the people that you have had to listen to. And somehow, unintentionally, it became clear that I'm the first person who is not a member of the judiciary, nor an esteemed member of the Constitutional Court who was coming to address you. That was compounded by the fact that the academic community generally is a very unique community. You are addressing people who not only know, they know that they know. <laughs> Add to that the presence of the media, that group of humanity, where everything you say, there's nothing that you can say that that was a casual remark. A small thing that you say that you regard as a footnote could end up being the main story. So you'll have to forgive me, therefore, for spending a bit of this afternoon trying to refine the speech so that I could try to fit my speech to this esteemed community. The pursuit of human rights and democracy has always been at the center of the struggle for democracy in this country. One of the beacons of hope that inspired the struggle was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted in 1948 by the United Nations. Closer home, we have always been inspired by documents such as the Freedom Charter, which were documents informed by the thinking and struggles of our people from all spheres of life. My address today focuses on the theme, the role of the public protector in protecting human rights and deepening democracy. I've structured the address in the following manner. Firstly, I thought I should share with you a, a real life story of someone who has lived during our times and has had to exercise their rights or vindicate their rights within the different, the multiplicity of institutions that are provided by our constitution. I will talk then very briefly about the place of the public protector in our constitutional architecture. That I will follow with a bit on the evolution of the institution of the ombudsman globally 
and the role of this institution within the checks and balances that safeguard democracy and human rights. I'll talk to you very briefly about the approach that at the Public Protector South Africa we use in pursuing our role. I will also talk about one matter that I regard as a precondition for the public protector to, re to realize its destiny, to operate optimally. And that that precondition applies to other institutions created by our constitution to support constitutional democracy. I will share with you a few case studies that reflect the role we have played in promoting human rights and deepening democracy. The adoption of the Constitution in 1996, following the first democratic elections, which took place in 1994, clearly sealed the country's commitment to constitutional democracy and human rights for all without discrimination. If you look at the preamble to our Constitution, amongst other things, it says the following. It seeks to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. It seeks to lay the foundation for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. The Constitution also seeks to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. What does this promise of democracy, human rights, and freedom mean to an ordinary person? I often refer to that ordinary person as Gogo Dlamini, which is Grandmother Dlamini. How does this play out in an ordinary person's daily life? where that person has to interface with the state and its bureaucracy every day. Yesterday, I related a story of Mr. N, who had to engage with democracy and the exercise of state power. Mr. N was employed by the state. And sometime last year, he was terminated from the public service because of, poor, of his poor health. According to the department, he was no longer able to perform his duties. The department that employed him discussed this matter with him, and he was made an offer. The offer included retirement benefits that excluded the reduction of his pension benefits. And he also was given an added period of three and a half years of service, and he was going to get a lump sum salary for that period. Unfortunately, this was never confirmed in writing. Lawyers know what that means. <laughs> the department subsequently terminated his service without following proper procedures, but more importantly, in the end, the department did not keep its promise. He was sent on early retirement, but he found himself with no medical aid subsidy, and the retirement package that he got was not a full retirement package as he had been promised. Mr. Adam came to my office, and the matter was investigated. At the end of the investigation, I came to the conclusion that the department's action <coughs> was wrong. In terms of the Public Protector Act, we call it improper conduct and maladministration. We concluded that the department failed to comply with the Constitution, the department failed also to comply with the principles of good administration, which is the opposite of maladministration. And of course, we also concluded that the principles 
enshrined in Section 33 of the Constitution and PAJA, which is the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, had been violated. So all of it together constituted improper conduct and maladministration. As a remedy, or firstly, we then said, based on the maladministration, Mr. N was prejudiced. And then, now that was prejudiced, he needed redress. For redress, my office was guided by Section 182, 1C of the Constitution, that I have to take appropriate remedial action. In the circumstances, I considered that appropriate remedial action was that he should get what he was promised. And this included him being reinstated with immediate effect, with effect from the 1st of November last year, and his package being reconstituted and a new process being started to investigate the possibility of his termination. I'm happy to say, though, that those, this is one of those cases where things start badly and they end well. The department concerned admitted that its action was wrong. The minister in consent, who is the minister of correctional services, even said that it was never her intention to place Mr. N at, an, at a disadvantage. All she was trying to do was to balance Mr. N's interest with the operational requirements of the department. And in the process, things went wrong. But I'm happy to say that he is going to be restored. As we speak, he has, they've already written to him, and he has to come back to work, and everything will be sorted out. This story arises in the context where we know that the Constitution guarantees everyone the right to equality, human dignity, freedom, and various other rights. More importantly, the Bill of Rights promises everyone the right to basic necessities of life, which includes social security, which was an issue in this particular case. The right to health care, where he, his medical aid was terminated. Other basic rights, such as housing, <coughs> water, food, education, just administrative section, and just administrative action, etc. Some of these rights impose positive obligations on the state, and others impose negative obligations on those who exercise public power. But all are essential for human existence. Indeed, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights agreed to in Vienna 1993 states that all human rights, human rights are indivisible and interdependent. But if you have no means to vindicate your rights, such rights are meaningless. Now, this takes us to the period before the Constitution and the period that we call after the Constitution. Before the Constitution, Mr. Elm's options were <coughs> confined to the classical checks and balances in a democracy. He could have approached a parliamentarian to raise the matter with the minister consent. He could have taken the matter to court. But to go to, to, go to court, he would have needed money, time, and the ability to understand and navigate the complex, exclusive dialogues, dialogue that takes place within the courts. Fortunately, the architects of our constitutional democracy gave Mr. N and others another chance and another voice for engaging with those who exercise public power whenever they feel wronged. That's the public protector, the others are the Human Rights Commission, and others. This takes me to the place of the public protector in our constitutional architecture. In a deliberate move to ensure that the government is accountable in respect of its responsibilities, the architects of our constitution established institutions such as the public protector 
there was, was over and above the traditional checks and balances, such as the legislature, courts, and tribunals. Most of these institutions are entrenched under Chapter 9 of the Constitution, but there are those that are not in Chapter 9. For example, the Public Service Commission, which is Chapter 10, and the, um, the Inspectorate of Intelligence, which is Chapter 11. But they, they all perform one role, which is to strengthen and support constitutional democracy through what we call complementary oversight. The idea behind these institutions was to have yet another set of institutions that will provide checks and balances to constrain the exercise of public power, to cap excesses in the exercise of public power with a view to deepening democracy and ensuring that people's rights are respected. We see that the end result was that then people have yet another chance and another voice to engage with the state. But I just want to indicate though that for that voice to work, we need what we call in my office after constitution thinking. We say in our society there is what we call before BC thinking, which is before constitution and after constitution thinking. In that we do have a constitution, but when we engage with each other, we often engage as if we are existing before the constitution, BC thinking. And when we do that, even though these rights are there, they are sabotaged by our action. During a meeting of the African Ombudsman and Mediators Association in Durban six months ago, former Chief Justice Sandy Lengova summed up the value of having a constitutionally defined public protector or Ombudsman as follows. The value of a constitutionally defined public protector or Ombudsman is that the independent investigation of government is an essential component of a strong constitutional democracy. The importance of the Ombudsman's role is especially clear in many countries throughout Africa, where there is often a desperate need for basic human necessities, from access to food and drinking water, to health care, housing, education, and social security. That's part of what we call after constitution thinking. Specifically, the constitution provides the following for the public protector. That is section 181 and section 182. Section 182 specifically says the public protector must investigate any conduct in state affairs or in the public administration in any sphere of government that is alleged or suspected to be improper or to result in any impropriety or prejudice to report on that conduct and to take appropriate remedial action. The Constitution says the public protector has additional powers as provided for by law. Interestingly, most people in South Africa talk about the public protector having only the power to recommend action in respect of maladministration. Incidentally, the Constitution says that the public protector must take appropriate remedial action. I think you are a community that is better placed than all of us in, in this country to try and give meaning to that and say if the drafters of our constitution wanted the public protector to only recommend remedial action, why did they use different wording? So I think as academics, particularly young academics that I see students, you have an opportunity to try and give us some kind of jurisprudence that tries to give meaning to this. Currently, a lot of the thinking is informed by what we call, again, before constitution thinking, where people would say, it's not a court of law, I only respect a court of law. It's almost section 182 does not exist. And 
In addition to the Constitution, there are 16 statutes that give responsibilities and powers to this, uh, to this office. I'm not going to mention all of them, but the key ones are the Public Protector Act, the Executive Members Ethics Act, the Protected Disclosures Act, Protected Protection of Access to Information Act, and one act that people don't usually know about, which is called the Protection of Housing Measures Act, where the public protector has completely different powers. It doesn't investigate maladministration there. Its powers are specifically to review the decision of the Home Builders Registration Council. Now, I have already indicated that that's what the Constitution provides. Previously, I think when I was here, I referred to President Nelson Mandela's remarks, where he showed an understanding that after the Constitution, things have changed. He said the following, even the most benevolent of governments are made up of people with all propensities for human failings. The rule of law as we understand it consists in a set of conventions and arrangements that ensure that it is not left to the whims of individual rulers to decide on what is good for the populace. The administrative conduct of government and authorities are subject to the scrutiny of independent organs. This is an essential element of good governance that we, that we have sought to build into our constitutional order. An essential part of that constitutional architecture is those state institutions supporting constitutional democracy. Among those are the public protector, the Human Rights Commission, the Auditor General, and then he mentions all the others. So basically, there was a deliberate attempt to make sure that beyond the old architecture, you introduce a complementary layer of oversight institutions to support and strengthen democracy. What are the implications of that for human rights? I think the answer lies in the evolution of the institution of the Ombudsman. We do know that the institution was introduced in Sweden originally, 202 years ago. And its main role then was to deal with administrative justice. The main role was if you're offended by the state from just rudeness right up to gross maladministration, abuse of power, capriciousness, abuse of state resources, uh, the ombudsman could deal with it. And it, the ombudsman in Sweden could even review the decisions of, justice, of judges where there was capriciousness and things like that. But the institution has evolved over the years. I want to say that even at the beginning, the institution may not have been called a human rights institution because it was not meant to be a human rights institution. It was there to exact accountability in the exercise of state power. When it became clear that the state was becoming powerful and bureaucracy became a very difficult wall sometimes for people to deal with. So that's why the King of Sweden introduced this war. But even then, its role was to deal with administrative justice, and administrative justice is a human right on its own. If we go back to our own constitution, it is protected by section 33 of the Bill of Rights in our constitution. But over the years, its role and impact has gone beyond just administrative justice. The institution, by holding the state accountable and making sure that those who exercise public power do so within the law and in accordance with the will and needs of the people, the institution of the Ombudsman has ensured that not only do we get administrative justice, but that state action contributes to the advancement of human rights. From the basic human rights such as human dignity, our colleague from Sweden has written a book about, for example, the importance of apologies. If we go to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human dignity is protected, and in our constitution is protected. So ombudsman work ranges from, from something that you think is small, such as being rude, but being rude may violate someone's human dignity. Um, right up to the failure to deliver, a, uh, to deliver a basic service such as water, electricity, 
or overcharging and things like that. That on its own has contributed to human rights. The other person who has spoken very broadly about uh, human rights is um, our colleague Macmillan from, um, from Australia, the, the Ombudsman of Australia, has spoken again very broadly. He wrote in 2006 about the potential, the, the underappreciated potential of the Ombudsman in advancing human rights. Because you don't deal with human rights directly, but the issues that you deal with in holding the state accountable invariably have an implication for human rights, right up to just dealing with corruption. There is a tension between corruption and human rights because human rights requires fair play, for example, in the award of contracts. So already by being corrupt, you've violated human rights. But more importantly, it's been said that corruption is a crime against the poor because to advance socioeconomic rights, which my colleague cares very deeply about, you need money and resources. You need planning, and you need people to adhere to those plans. If they don't do that, um, you cannot um, uh, advance human rights. In the discourse around the so-called Arab Spring that we've heard about what's happening in the Middle East, it has even been suggested that there is some anecdotal evidence suggesting that countries that have an effective ombudsman have better human rights, better respect for human rights, and a more stable democracies. Because of course, as I have said, is that apart from holding the state accountable, you are giving people an, an opportunity, a voice to engage with the state, which increases agency, which increases uh, social agency for people, which also increases trust and hope in the system or in the democratic project. What is our approach as a public protector? I've just quickly to say that we don't regard the public protector as a human rights institution per se. It is there to <coughs> advance accountability in the state, in the exercise of state power. But one of the key outcomes of that is human rights. Because it's there to make sure that when your right has been infringed, whether a human right or just an ordinary right, when your right has been infringed through unjust administrative action, you can come to the public protector and hold the state accountable. But more than that, when the state just exercises power arbitrarily, outside the law, outside the instrument that grants those power, you can use this instrument to hold the state accountable. That is ultimately, as I have indicated, contributes to human rights. Uh, it has been said that a public protector or an ombudsman institution contributes to human rights in the following manner. It reinforces a strong tradition of civil society. It establishes respect for human rights. It is a, an important contributor to the maintenance of the rule of law. And obviously, it is part of the broader oversight framework that makes sure that constitutional obligations are known and respected, that policies legislation and administrative practices or in, in administrative prescripts are complied with. Just some of the examples of what, what, we've, what we have done. And the main area, obviously, where this office has, has, has operated is in the area of administrative justice. I can tell you lots of stories from Mr. N Previously, when I was here in Cape Town, I told the story of Miss M, who, who just applied for a social grant for her children. And when she applied for the social grant, uh, she was told, no, you are already getting this grant. And she said, no, I'm not getting it. That's why I'm here. And they said, no, you are getting it for two children. And, and, and they sent her away. Obviously, she would have had to go to court, but she didn't have the money. Uh, so she came here. Uh, eventually what emerged was that really somebody else was getting the grant and that person was an imposter, an identity thief. That person has, had paid officials from the Department of Home Affairs for this duplicate, what they call a duplicate identity. She had paid about 30 rand to health officials to give her a card for, for the children. 
She had paid money to Sasa people also, about 300 rand, just really small amounts to corrupt the system. And, and, and she was receiving money from the supermarket. And um, in the end, the investigation established all of that. And as we speak, uh, she has been restored. Um, after the intervention by my office, she was restored. And uh, she got her money from the date of application. Those are areas of administrative justice. I can speak about to that. Um, but I just want to say, when we deal with administrative justice through the Ombudsman, it's beyond just, just administrative action. We have moved even into the area of delict. Historically, if a municipal truck bashed your wall, you would have been required to go to court to prove uh, that they were negligent in doing that and to say the municipality was vicariously li liable for the actions of, of the fellow who bashed your truck. But through the ombudsman, here in Cape Town, we had somebody who came, a grandmother, who came and said, I don't have money to go to court. The municipality says, I must hire a lawyer. They agree that the truck was bashed, the, the, wall, uh, the wall was bashed by the truck, but they're saying, uh, go to court. And she didn't have the money, but she came to us, we dealt with it, they've now paid her 37,000 rand. We've dealt with issues of social justice, I can share maybe during the discussion, we have dealt with school, uh, in, in social justice areas, we've dealt with issues also that include distribution of resources for uh, distribution of resources between schools in the Eastern Cape. There was a school where they didn't have toilets and they didn't have uh, brick classrooms. Uh, here we've dealt with admission to a school in Mullerton High School. Uh, lastly, we've also, we've also dealt with issues of social integration, particularly uh, uh, non-nationals coming in, disability issues. We've also lastly dealt with issues of ethical governance, which also have implications for human rights. You would say, why do they have implications for human rights? Um, uh, Professor Levenbeck has already spoken about some of the areas, but the other area we've dealt with is the area of conflict of interest. For the human rights, for human rights, to be realized, people who exercise public power have to make sure that they place public interest above all, including their personal interests. So that's why our decisions around the issues of ethical governance have been important. From just the small act of not managing your, your conflict of interest right up to abuse of power and corruption, uh, that has been an, a, an issue. Um, we've dealt with a, some of the things that we've dealt with have contributed to co co poverty alleviation and the pursuit of millennium development goals. Um, I don't want to, you know, to read the full speech. We will make it available. But basically, I just think in summary, I would say that the role of the public protector is around really being a, a complementary institution that reinforces checks and balances in the exercise of public power. Most of the work is around the exercise of administrative power by primarily the executive, but parliament often exercises administrative power. Within the courts, administrative power is also often exercised in the management of courts, uh, the management of files there in the courts, uh, transcripts, etc. So the, the role of the office covers every exercise of administrative power by anyone. Three levels of government, national, provincial, and, and local, and all three spheres of, of government when they're dealing with administrative action. Ultimately, though I have indicated just ultimately though for everything that I have said, it is only possible when the thinking is what we call after constitution thinking, AC thinking instead of BC thinking. One of the areas that we, we're contending with regarding that is the area of what we call implementation of remedial action. Before constitution thinking says we won't implement because you're not a court of law. After constitution thinking says, what's the point of having the public protector if it cannot provide redress? And we have in this, in this particular regard uh, alluded to global jurisprudence. <coughs> 
emerging from countries where the powers of the ombudsman are to recommend remedial action, but the courts have said you must implement unless the ombudsman dis omb ombudsman's decision is irrational. In other words, no ombudsman faced with the same circumstances and the same facts would have arrived at the same decision. And then we have said from our side then that um, if the state will not implement, at least go to court because section 181.3 says these institutions are subject only to the constitution and the law, which is similar to section 165 for courts. So we're saying then uh, at least somebody has to take it to court. Uh, not everyone has what we call BC thinking. A lot of people have AC thinking. Hence, 95% of the matters that we deal with are implemented, are, are resolved through um, a, a ADR, or what we call appropriate dispute resolution measures. Uh, I have various quotations here from people who have what we call after constitution thinking. One of them is the Deputy Minister of Justice, Minister, uh, uh, Deputy Minister Andrew Snell, who has said the following. The Office of the Public Protector is very important to democracy, especially in a country like South Africa, in which the majority of people were subjected to oppression and injustices that were pe perpetrated by the apartheid regime. It is institutions like the Public Protector which must ensure that the vision contained in our constitution is realized for all citizens, especially the poor and vulnerable. We have a sound architecture as a country, and we have a lot of people who are willing and able to implement. The only thing that can stop us from realizing what the preamble in the Constitution promises is if we don't manage some of the challenges that we have. One of the key challenges that I have indicated is what I call BC thinking before constitution thinking. But another challenge is really the administrative challenges within the administration, such as poor, poor skills, lack of knowledge of the systems and prescripts, and lastly, self-interest and corruption. If we can manage this, we have excellent architecture, we can build a state that is accountable that operates with integrity at all times and is responsive to the needs of all the people of this country. Thank you.